I'm Rit Udison, Executive and Artistic Director at the Loft Literary Center. Welcome to this live stream at Virtual Wordplay. I'm so glad you're here with us. Before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about what brought us here today. For the last year, the Loft staff has been working hard to put together an outdoor book festival that would have gathered 100 authors with 10,000 visitors in our neighborhood in downtown Minneapolis. As COVID-19 hit, we knew we had to think about everything we do differently, especially this festival. While we were disappointed that we wouldn't be able to gather in person, we became even more committed to supporting writers, celebrating new books, and finding new ways to assert the connective power of the written word. In a time of anxiety, we want to offer a powerful event for readers, writers, and booksellers. When we first approached our sponsors, their first question was, what is a virtual festival? And to be honest, we didn't know. Our founding partners, St. Catherine University and Star Tribune, agreed to make a leap of faith with The Loft. With courage, generosity, and vision, they have worked alongside us to figure out what this virtual festival might become. We are grateful to our sponsors and donors. Their generosity is incredible, but it is not enough. We believe it is essential, especially during a health and financial crisis, to offer programs that are free and accessible to all. But that has led to a significant revenue loss. A live event would have included ticket revenue, beer sales, exhibitor fees, and additional sponsorships. The Loft is not closed. We continue to offer classes, fellowships, conversations, support for readers and writers in addition to this festival. We are here to support the literary community and we ask that you continue to support us. If you are able, please consider making a contribution to The Loft today. Thank you for being here. Hi, I'm Steph Opitz. I'm the founding director of The Loft's Wordplay, and I'm so excited to be here today with Allison Roman and Emma Straub. Um, I wanna quickly say thank you to our sponsors, St. Catharines University and the Star Tribune for helping us be here, and also to all the attendees and authors who have supported us through this really wild ride of a virtual festival. Um, we meant to get together in person in a couple weeks in Minneapolis, but I'm just so thrilled that we can still get together um, this way. So really quickly, before we start drinking, um, mm -hmm. I would be shocked <laughs> if these two women need introductions, but I'll just do it for the cheap seats. Uh, Allison Roman is a cook, writer, and author of best-selling cookbooks, Dining In and Nothing Fancy. She's a bi-weekly columnist for the New York Times cooking section, as well as a monthly contributor to Bon, uh, bon Appetit magazine. She is the mastermind behind hashtag the stew hashtag the cookie and many other it only takes one word and a hashtag to identify them recipes <laughs> isn't it weird to like have no laughter you're like i'm just gonna assume everyone's laughing, <laughs> I'm laughing. I'm laughing. I'm laughing. <laughs> yeah i'm like also cognizant of speaking over people because every time i'm in a zoom i'm like oh my god yeah what like huh? <laughs> I, i'm practicing restraint so i it's like <laughs> like i let someone finish a thought and then i speak which is amazing <laughs> Uh, for lack of being entertained. We all, we're all learning this new domain. Uh, New York Times bestselling author, bookstore owner, literary icon Emma Straub has written five books, The Vacationers, Modern Lovers, Laura Lamont's Life and Pictures, the short story collection, Other People We've Met, and her most recent, which comes out next week, All Adults Here. Um, you can buy that 
at the link below. Oh yeah, there's there's Emma's new book. And unfortunately, I don't have a physical copy of that yet because, uh, you know, quarantine, but I do have um, <laughs> Nothing Fancy, which came out in October. You can buy both books at the link below. I think if I go like this, you can see like a link below me. Um, so get them at your nearest indie bookstore, which may just be Emma's bookstore, Books Are Magic. So please Might do be. support um, these wonderful writers and um, support bookstores and books, books, books. Bye, bye, bye. Um, so thank you both so much for being here. And Allison, please show these, my Emma and I, two uh, martini neophytes how it's done. Okay. Um, well, first, thank you for having us. This is really fun. Um, it always is like such a treat when you're like, oh, well, you do a work thing with like a person you enjoy talking with anyway. It's like, yeah, I would love that. Um, also, Emma and I have a ketchup and mustard thing happening right now, which was not planned, but very cute. So thank you, Emma. Uh, love I'll, it. I'll, I'll be the mustard to your ketchup any day, Alice. I feel the same way. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I feel like um, I have been drinking a lot of martinis <laughs> in quarantine. I feel like it is, um, historically speaking, a cocktail that I would only drink at a restaurant. It's like, oh, this is like my Keen's drink or, you know, Raul's or any of the restaurants that I miss so, so dearly. Um, but then kind of like, took back the martini and was like, you know what? I can make a martini at home. Um, and I put the recipe for this one in Nothing Fancy, um, which is just like less of a recipe and more just kind of a note that you should be making martinis at home. And you don't have to be like a mustachioed bartender. Uh, oh, there she is. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's the one, that's the one. Uh, to make a martini and my friend Robbie, who is like, a real a real gin head um basically has been talking about this for years and it's just like why don't people just make them at home you can make them in anything and as a person who's kind of allergic to the concept of cocktails like i'm not it's just they're not for me i'm like oh like let me just pour the wine into the glass or the alcohol into the glass um the idea of like concocting something with different alcohols feels like just not my lane but a martini i can absolutely get behind because it's two ingredients um <laughs> and for this one, I, even though I am just, even though I just am, I'm alone here, I still think it's like a fun thing to batch your martinis. So I'm going to make not quite the batch that I would if I were having people over, of course, because that would indicate that I am drinking way too much, um, although this does not expire. <laughs> um, but I'm going to make like a jar full of martini and I'm going to put it in my freezer. And that way, whenever I want one, I can just like make a little martini, just like a little teeny. Um, I'm like rereading my recipe just so I don't like <laughs> everyone. Um, but this is for six to 10 people. So I'm going to have it. So basically it's equal. I like my martinis to be like a 50, 50 style. And that means equal parts gin or vodka and, uh, dry vermouth. Um, Steph, I see we have the same stolen dry vermouth, not sponsored, just the one that I happen to get. Well, well, and I will quickly mm -hmm. mention that Gray Duck uh, Vodka did sponsor this event, so I'll be making it with them. But that. I love it. When mine arrives, I will also be making it with that as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but basically, so I will make something like this in a measuring cup. Um, I think it's eyesore of a telephone out of my way. Um, and oh, let's let's call it, I'll do one and a quarter cups. Or that might actually be too much. <laughs> Again, this is a this is a big batch, but I'm gonna pour it into my jar. Yeah, that's not gonna fit in this jar. Um, okay, so you know what I'm gonna do instead? I'm just gonna do three quarters of a cup of gin. Watch as I pour this gin back into the gin bottle. Uh, actually, just kidding. <laughs> I mean, you can, it's basically just like a ratioed system. Um, but because I am like hell bound on filling this one specific jar with martini, I, I must <laughs> make sure that it fits. Um, I didn't do this obviously beforehand. Um, the best thing about me in this kind of quarantine reality where I'm doing like events and Zooms and lives is that I'm just a wildly unprepared person for basically anything. And so this just really, 
exacerbates that. And I just like show up in front of the computer and I'm like, oh, I should have <laughs> maybe measured these things out before. But anyway, okay. So equal parts of gin and driver notes. So I have a half a cup and then another half a cup or, you know, how much ever. See, that that seems like a lot though, Allison. I thought that we're for me, that you're supposed to like, you know, wave it over the top. Well, that's for like, a, that's, there's many different varieties of martini. This yeah. to me, the 50, it's called a 50, 50. Um, it's lower ABV oh because you're using some, you're using more dry vermouth than gin, um, depending yeah. on where you, yeah. Sometimes it's just a rinse in the glass. Sometimes it's like shaken with a bit or stirred yeah. with a bit. But for my personal preference, I'm like really into the 50, 50 vibe. I think it tastes better. It's more yeah. palatable and you get yeah. Uh, yeah. longer to get totally wasted. Which these days we need all the help. Um, okay. Yeah. So, and then for this, I'm going to use just two ounces of water. So I include water in this batch cocktail because typically if you're a bar, restaurant, whatever, they're like shaking it or stirring it. And not only is that chilling your martini, but it's diluting it with water, making something that you can drink rather than just like trying to chug alcohol. So in order to kind of get yeah. that same thing without having to shake or stir in individual martinis, again, very helpful when you're having people over or you just want to like have a, a batch ready to go. Um, I will add water to it, which is about a quarter cup. So I'm doing the full recipe aggressively, but I just- Hell yeah, so I love that for you. <laughs> so this is essentially like your martini mix and you wanna, you know, toss it cause you know, alcohol weighs different than water and blah, 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 <laughs> science. Um, and this is like the mixture that you would put, like if I were having a party, which I'm not, I would put this out with like my olives and lemon and a peeler. And then I would sort of encourage people to fill their glasses with ice. And that way they can have a martini the way that they want. Um, I know thinking, why are you serving a martini over ice? I like my beverages extremely cold, especially when there's alcohol involved. And like a martini on the rocks is definitely a thing that a person who is serious about cocktails will tell you is not a thing, but it's a thing in my house. So, and that's where we are. So guess what? Um, I'm going to fill my glass with ice. I also don't own a martini glass. Um, I think that they're impractical. Uh, I am clumsy and I would break them. So I'm just going to use a regular glass. Um, those are really cute though. I, I want like a coupe style, which you do have. I need to get them. Um, these were a wedding gift. I got married five years ago. This is the first time I'm using them. I'm very excited. <laughs> they're extremely elegante. Um, <laughs> And I have been really into the twist and olive, but you know, do you? I'm gonna do a twist, which to me is just a peel of lemon that I will kind of rub around the rim. Also embarrassing, my nails are like in really bad shape right now. I feel like people are always like, why do you keep your nails so perfect? I'm like, have you ever, have you looked closely? Um, Cause they're not, they're not. Um, but yeah, I'm going olive and lemon twist and then you just pour this over your ice this is like barely a recipe <laughs> i have to can i admit something to you guys You're i just told totally, i totally cheated which is that so i asked a friend of mine who is like a cocktail expert like a real expert person um if i could borrow like if she had any glasses or like like swizzly things uh -huh. uh, and she loaned me a lot of things, but then she also included this tiny little batched version of them. So I just poured, <laughs> what? that's what I did. Emma, that's like, that's good. I mean, I just, okay, how about this? So I'll compare and contrast. This one's gin and I'll do a vodka one too, and then I'll do a taste test. Great. How about okay. that? That's yours. Amazing. Thank you guys for, for joining me uh, for this cocktail. Ooh. Ooh. Wow. Good. Oh, that's good. Emma, I feel like yours was yours properly diluted. Did they <laughs> my advice? Um, I'm making that face. I mean, I feel like it should be like a smooth experience. I don't know. I don't know. She wrote me <laughs> here. I just, anyway, you know, I, I love, love it. it. I love it. I Okay. Well, it tastes delicious. Cheers. This is just my speed in terms of ease and 
to use Alice in one of your words, riffable and drinking. It's great. I do love a riff. What can I say? <laughs> um, can I can I tell you guys that I know how to make something too, and that I'm gonna make it live? I did. This is a surprise. Okay. <laughs> that was, that was a surprise. Okay. And only at um, hashtag law forward play. <laughs> um, okay. So what I know how to make and have a fancy machine for, I don't know if you can see it. Mm -mm. Um, I bought a button maker. Oh, wow. And I, um, I've been designing some, some Alice and Roman theme. <gasps> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm about to make some buttons live on <laughs> This first one, in case you didn't see, says potato bar. Oh my God. This is very, I feel like this is, it's is, I didn't do anything for you. You wrote a whole book. You wrote yeah. a whole book. I mean, you know what I mean? Like in this, in this specific moment. Let's see. Okay, there we go. Now it's a button. This is oh I, I can while we're you until I can have that in my possession. I'm gonna keep going while we're talking and just surprise you when they're done. <laughs> Should we sell them for charity? Just start like a yeah, sure. sort of thing and just auctioning you them up. It. Yep. Right? Yeah. Love it. How, yeah. how are you feeling yeah. like a week before pre-pub? I feel like that you are you are kind of like you have you know so much how the sausage is made, like being a bookseller and <laughs> being an author at the same time that like I yeah. can't imagine, like, do you find that the, that knowing as much as you know is comforting or are you like, I know too much. I got to just make buttons full time now. Um, ask me about my personal journey. <laughs> 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 oh my God. You know, I, I do like, I do feel like I normally, I feel like I know too much, but right now I feel like I, I know, um, I know what I know which is that it's like a tough time, but that like, but that everyone's trying their best and that like, I mean, and I say this like as a bookseller, but also as like just a person who believes it to be true. Like, I feel like there are a lot of kinds of books that could come out right now and it'd be like, Ooh, no. But I feel like my book like actually is the kind of book that will make people feel better and that can make people happy right now. So I feel like if people can get it into their houses, they're going to be happy. It's there. Um, so, and that makes me feel good. Like as a person who wants to do that, you know, like that's my, that's my goal. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, of course it's like, I mean, on the one hand, it's sad, I mean, it's sad. The world is sad, but like, it's sad not to have like the, you know, the book tour experience, whatever that I was, that I was planning, but also look at this goofy stuff, you know, like, <laughs> stuff. I mean, what the heck and heck, what is going on over here? Just <laughs> our is on my laptop. I don't know who's watching. We have no idea what's going on. Like, are, like, yeah, this is wild. One spicy meatball. <laughs> I feel like one of your children needs that one. They, um, yeah, they, Miles loves those spicy meatballs. Those spicy meatballs we made those on Christmas or yeah, I think on Christmas. Right. So good. You were um, also just like been such a champion of, I feel like not obviously selfishly my work, but also you're just, you're so good at like rallying people that like, are a part of our little like I li we live in the same neighborhood Emma and I so I feel like we've got like a cute little you know writerly uh neighborhood vibe uh happening um and Emma's just been always so crazy supportive and it is sort of yeah like a bummer not to be able to celebrate the same thing for you in this way Can but we will talk about I feel like any sort of celebration that's being put off right now just means like you get another one later there you go I love you I love my <laughs> I was you like, talked about the first time that you two met, where you said you live in the same neighborhood. Do you remember when you two first met? Um, probably when I had we already met when you when your first book came out when we had the thing for your first book. Oh yeah, we met, we met for dining in. No, no, no. But before that, we did. 
the, just in the neighbor. I can't remember. I, I mean, think it, it might have been like one of the first times we actually met, but we had been like, yeah. like a lot of things now. It's like, you meet on the internet first and then you become actual yeah. friends. Yeah. Um, and, and, Cla and, and Allison is also very good friends with my literary agent, Claudia, who she, I hope she's Hi, watching. Claudia. Hey, Claudia. <laughs> Are you watching? Hi, Claudia. <laughs> um, um, but, I don't know, but yeah, I mean, you know, Allison is one of those people where I just like, she like sauntered along and I was like, okay, I'm going to keep you, I'm going to keep you, um, you but know, and, it, when, and when nothing fancy came out, I feel like I was living at the bookstore. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes. Allison, the poor thing, like, you know, no. we, I like, I text her and I'm like, Allison, can you come and sign 700 more books? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a little hard to read. That one's a little hard to read. No, I can read it. It's a Allison Roman fan club. I can stop that a mile away. I get it. <laughs> but I'm clear. Um, yeah, yeah, it's like it's like a nice vibe to also have. I mean, there's. I mean, all independent bookstores are obviously we're supporting, and it's it's important to like talk about them, especially in an era of convenience shopping. But it feels more special to like have an actual connection to the people that own it and there's like a genuine camaraderie and vibe when you go into that bookstore and like, yeah, I don't know. And like, I've done, I've done like your gift wrapping thing, I think three years in a row or two, two years. Was it two years? I'm a little gem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's it. That, those are all, all my merch. <laughs> all my um, but yeah, I don't know. I feel like we, we sort of just, yeah, knew. I also had read Emma's books before I met her. So that was like another thing where like, I was familiar with her work. Um, and I remember when you guys bought the store, cause that it was like the first book sort of come back and there was another bookstore, it closed and you're like, we can't have this, yeah. we gotta have a bookstore. Yeah. Um, and I hadn't lived in the neighborhood yet. So then when I moved, it felt like, oh yeah, I live over there with a cool bookstore. <laughs> it's really all about Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you're, yeah, you're both oh. you guys are still like shipping stuff. You guys are like- it's, Oh yeah, it's, you know, oh yeah. Yeah. And what's really fun is that like, you know, I feel like normally, like if life was normal and my book was coming out right now, like, I don't know, it would, it would all feel like really fractured. Like it would be like, there's that part of my life and this part of my life and that part of my life. But right now it feels really like it's just all one thing, mm -hmm. which which is very much like the book too. You know, it's like, here we are. Like when I wrote the book, I really, I thought like, I was like, first, like I have to set this book upstate because no one would believe that like this kind of environment would exist in New York City, even though this is my yeah. whole life. Like walking, um, you know, a few blocks and I see like my, like, you know, a, like boy I kissed in high school and then my <laughs> like 11th grade math teacher and my like, you know, like all these people. Um, but I see all those people all day long, every day. And it's both really nice and I love it. And sometimes it's like, okay, so who am I to them? Like, am I newly minted 40 year old Emma or am I 16 year old jerky Emma or am I 22 year old Emma or am I six year old Emma? Um, and that's really what the book is about. Um, and so now it, it feels, I mean, I, I won't say it feels right because of course it doesn't, but, but it does feel, um, like this moment gets even more like closer to the heart of it. Um, which is like about family and loneliness and making mistakes and, you know, all that fun stuff. Yeah, but and to your point, I feel like that's exactly the kind of stuff that helps people at a time like this. Like I really enjoy like kind of immersing myself in that. And it kind of like, I feel like when you experience something like anxiety or loneliness, like as a general feeling in life, part of what makes it worse or more unbearable is when you're experiencing it alone or you feel like, why am I the only one who's feeling this way? And right now everyone is. So in a way, like a lot of people I know, myself included, who've like, struggled with that stuff before feel actually way better now because <laughs> it's like oh everyone is going through that and that makes it feel like a lot more of a level playing field yeah but you're like 
I, I told him I just started it last night because I was not at home and then I just got home and I, I have the book here at my house. Um, but it's, it's so, so good. And it does. And, and I had this thought and then I was like, oh, that's the name of the title. But I was like, oh, it does feel more adult, but not like in a stodgy way. It just feels more evolved. Um, and like, you know, I think that's hard. Like if you're an author, someone like you who's written so many books, and like, you're not a different person than the first one you wrote, but you are a more grown yeah. up. You, you have yeah. evolved. And I think that that's like why you keep returning to different authors that have, are so prolific. And it's not because mm -hmm. they're offering something radically different. It's just like a more, a more nuanced take of the first thing that you fell in love with. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that like, you know, I think that I could, I think that I could write novels could and probably will write novels for the rest of my life that are just about families and family dynamics and like people's relationships with their partners and parents and children and spouses because that's that's what I find most interesting and like when I think now about like so my first my first book which I can tell you from the bookstore and also from looking at my royalty statements is the one that nobody, nobody reads. Um, <laughs> um, is it, like, it's the most different from the rest of my books, but it's, it's this historical novel and it spans 60 years in this woman's life. And when I think about it now, like when I think about me as like a 20, <laughs> eight year old writing that book, I'm like, wow, look at you, look at you, you cute little ambitious thing. Like I just, I was like, of course I can write this book about, you know, this woman who um, has all of this loss experiences, all of this loss and like loses her husband and there's all this mental illness. And like, I just, I just was not afraid because I was, I think I was too young and too excited to worry about getting it wrong. And now I'm like, wow, that is crazy that I wrote a book that was like about parenting a difficult, difficult people and all of these having, things. Having had a child or yeah. something. And now, and now I'm like, oh God, like, I mean, I think all, I think that all writers probably feel this way that like, you know, if you could go back and write, I don't know if you even feel this way, Allison, about dining in that like, if you could, if you went, if you picked that up today and, and your publisher was like, Allison, you can change anything you want. There are probably oh, tons of stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I definitely about nothing fancy and that just came out. I'm like, uh, can we like, reprint some of those things? Um, yeah. I think that that's, I mean, that is also the struggle of any writer, I guess, when you make a book, you're like, oh, that's literally forever. And there's like a party that wants to just be like, oh no, that's not me now. Like, this is me now, but it still exists. People can still buy it. People can still read it. Yeah. And like, a person picking up your first book would be like, oh, this is Emma. And you're like, oh no, 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 that's not Emma. <laughs> no, no, yeah. this is Emma. <laughs> that yeah. is a different person. And yeah. you know, that anxiety that comes with immortalizing something because it's not just a story you're telling, but you're also like, defining who you are at that time, whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction, but it's, that's the hardest part for me about writing books is being like, this is a declarative statement. I am, I am like making, I am, I am putting this in stone. Like this is me forever so that people can then like track. Yeah. I don't know. It's like very scary to me. Um, and you, you also, you are also not afraid. It seems to me of I'm making <laughs> statements yeah. that are like I don't know like yeah. I'm no it's true I mean but I think that that's what I've become more comfortable with because I realized that like I can't there there's something I'm realizing now that like there is a I'm like hiding a bit behind my opinions and that like mm. it's my opinion and like people can't argue with it because it's my prerogative or it's my take on something and I think that like, especially in what I do, which is cooking and, you know, how to and sort of service journalism, there's an element of like, well, well how are you supposed to roast a chicken? It's like, well, I, listen, there are a million ways to roast a chicken. This is how I like to do it. This is my take. And here's yeah. why I can back that up with opinions, thoughts, and personal evidence. 
could you do it another way? Sure. Yeah. Like, and I think that just kind of by leading with, this is how I do it. This is what my preference is. It is an opinion. Um, it leaves less room for someone to be like, that's not how you roast a chicken. You know, it's like, okay, Brad, calm down. <laughs> um, and I, I had just like actually written something, um, for my friend Amanda, who's a, an editor and I submitted something this morning and she wrote back, <laughs> she totally like called me out. She's like, she's like this, she's like, this is great. Like you da 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 da. He's, she's like, you're so great at writing like opinions and making declarative statements and you know who you are. She's like, but you are really afraid of like getting into like what is essentially the how and the why of a story, which is like essentially code for like, you're afraid to be honest or you're afraid to be vulnerable in the situation. She's mm. like, this is it's like this story is a bread sandwich and I was like oh my god yes you're so right because it's the first time that I'd written something that's not food based or recipe based it was just like a personal essay on like oh boy and Dude, that's like, editor oh, as yes. therapist yeah it, she it literally feels like going to therapy I'm like I'm gonna need a few more days with this Amanda um but it was really crazy I was like oh right like I I hide behind like the service journalism part and I imagine I've never written anything fiction before, but I imagine that for somebody writing fiction, there's an element of that too, where you're like able to inject a certain amount of yourself into it, but also ultimately always hide behind oh, yeah. writing fiction, you know? Oh God. Oh God. I mean, the, like the fact that some people write memoir is just beyond me. I'm like, do you guys know there's an easier way? There's an easier way. <laughs> you can just make it up people. Yeah. Like you can tell all the same. It's funny. I argue with my six-year-old about this all the time because River is, is a nonfiction reader. Mm. Vastly prefers nonfiction. And sometimes we get into arguments about the merits of fiction and, and nonfiction. And I, and he says, you know, I like nonfiction because it's true because it's, or because it's real. And I say, well, sure, right. The, those facts, those facts are, are real. Although he also reads a lot of like questionable, like monster, um, like cryptozoology books. So uh, facts are, you know, fuzzy. Wait, but, there, yeah. but, I, but I say like, you know, the, the, the point of fiction and like my goal always in writing fiction is to, to, to write things that are equally true and equally real, but that might not have actually happened to specific people in the way that it does in the book, but that like, like the feelings should always be real. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I think that it's amazing the way people make themselves vulnerable and write straight up memoir. I'm like, yeah. I was like, oh, that's not for me, actually. <laughs> <There's> you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm you sad we're not in Minneapolis, but I am enjoying just like having this martini and listening to you guys talk about this. Um, <laughs> I'm going to open it up. To, it up. Just chat it up. I love it. Um, I'm going to open it up to audience questions in just a minute. But before I do, I wanted to ask, I mean, both of you are so prolific. Emma, you've written five books. Um, Allison, you've written two, but you also have a column and you're contributing and doing all this. How do you, how do you stay creative? How do you stay fresh? And does it feel like particularly daunting right now, given the world? Emma? <laughs> um, I will say, <sighs> I mean, it's, you know, I think norm, like in before life before this, um, like I had no problems being creative. My, my only problem is time management. Like my only problem is that I have two human children and one bookstore child that like, those are my only problems. <laughs> like that, those are the only things standing in the way of me writing like a million books and doing everything that I want to do creatively. Um, but right now, you know, I'm homeschooling my four-year-old and six-year-old and doing God knows what all day. Um, like we, 
we like wrote out the schedule for the day and we were supposed to do, um, like some exercise, exercise class. And they both were like, no, even though they mostly like it. And so we, the exercise class that we did was them, um, lying on the floor and giving me, and then, and me giving them like the, uh, like the last three minutes of yoga class massage, basically, you know, like the best oh, yeah. part of yoga class. Like yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> that was our gym class today. Yeah. Um, which was great for all of us. Um, but in terms of creativity right now, no. Um, although, you know, I don't know, I guess like at the moment, like my creativity is like focused on like goofy, like just straight up goofy button book making. promotion. <laughs> <Button making. laughs> Yeah. Like, I mean, really it's like, what am I doing? I'm sitting here writing. I love wine, (laughs) you know, um, or like, so at the store, um, we have Alex Chi, Alexander Chi twice this week, um, as a moderator, because of course now, like there are no boundaries for anything. Um, and I was like, wait a minute. I need to get him. I need to ask him to record himself saying it's chi week. I love him so much. I love him so much. And he did. And I was like, that, like, that is where my creativity is going right now. Is like he's on the advice on the advisory board of wordplay. Chi fans abound. We love him. (laughs) He's the greatest. Um yeah, so that's where my creativity is at the moment. Um, you know, I do have a deadline for my next book, but it isn't for a good long while. And so I feel like, um, you know, if that's how I'm riding out these days, um, that's okay. How about you, Allison? Um, it's funny you ask. Uh, I'm not feeling especially <laughs> creative or inspired. Um, I think that I I'm an overthinker in general and like, my best stuff happens when I'm not overthinking it, when I'm just like feeling like loose and casual and, and things just kind of come and I'm feeling like, oh, that's a great idea. Or like, I feel inspired. But right now I think that I'm so in my head about like trying to like help the people and like provide a specific service. And it's really hard to know if you have access to their bandwidth, how people are actually cooking. And I think that we've kind of calmed down on the like, it's got to be you know, 40 pounds of lentils and like a can of black yeah. beans. And I feel like yeah. now knowing what I know about like upstate New York, Brooklyn, Manhattan, like what's available, what people have access to California. I have people in different States where I call and literally I'm like, next time you order groceries, let me know what they have and what they don't have. Like I'm trying yeah. to get as much intel as possible to yeah. make informed decisions on what the recipes are that I'm, that I should be writing right now to like better serve humanity. Oh. Yeah. So that's a little dramatic, but, um, but I remember when this first thing, when this first went down, Emma tweeted something like, if you don't have kids right now and you're not taking advantage of this time to write your next novel or like write your ass off, like I don't even know what to say to you. And I read it and I was like, (laughs) 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 I don't have any kids. I literally am like alone and I'm still like, I can't write anything, you know? You know know what though? You know what? I'm... First of all, I'm sorry. Allison. No, I just, and, you're, when I wake up every morning, I'm like, what would Emma do? Emma would be writing well, today. Emma would be taking advantage of the time. Well, but the thing is, is, and, and like, you know, I think that, you know, like all of us, like my feelings and sort of awareness about what this feels like for everyone have sort of evolved as, as time has gone on. And like at first, like the first two weeks, I was like, what? I am not, I like, I can't handle this. I can't handle being with my kids all day long because they're really loud and just really particular humans. Um, but then like, once I like sort of got over that, like what I have realized about my situation is that like, what's actually really nice is that because I'm with them all day long, I'm not watching CNN. I'm not listening to NPR. I'm not reading the newspaper except for like little periods here and little periods there. So I'm not 
I feel like there are a lot of people, especially people who live alone or only with other adults who are like just feeling crushed by information and sadness, which of course, like, how can you not be in this um, if you have access to all of that? But I feel like because I'm spending my days like making buttons with my children and like playing with Mr. Potato Head, um, you know, I have like, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit free from that stuff in a way that I didn't anticipate. So, which is to say if people who do not have children and, or just live alone or just with other adults aren't being productive, I really understand it now. So Allison, you are absolved. Uh, I think that that's like the other part is just like generally being kinder to yourself right now to like, not like the whole like King Lear joke, right? Like let's, maybe this isn't the time. Maybe this is like pre King Lear. And I've always done my best work under pressure and you know, three days after the deadline. And right now, like there's kind of no deadline. And so I'm having a really tough time like focusing and uh, also, I was upstate living with my two friends for the, almost two months. And as a person who typically lives alone, and when I write, I even leave my apartment, even though I live alone in Brooklyn, I still like will go upstate and like rent a house somewhere, or, like go to New Mexico and like live somewhere else alone because being in my apartment is too much of a distraction. I am like a, an eight year old. Like I just, like, I cannot sit still. I'm like, oh, I better like wipe off my plant leaves and like it's <laughs> so impossible. So I, you know, on one hand, I was like, oh, being out of my apartment will be great because I'll be able to focus. But then on the other hand, I have like two people who I like spending time with, even though they were working too. I just, it was a real challenge. So hopefully like being back in the space, once I've wiped off every plant leaf, I will then <laughs> get cracking on that next one. <laughs> um, this is a question from Pam Gardo. Um, she said, Emma, could you give us the elevator pitch for your new book and tell us where the inspiration came from? And I'll add to that. Maybe you could also show us a little bit more of your jumpsuit. Ooh. So the jumpsuit. The jumpsuit is just a plain, plain jumpsuit, but it has this um, embroidered patch. Oh, that's not a sticker or a pin. That is a patch on your jumpsuit. It's a patch. It's a patch. Um, you know, you know. Uh, you got to do what you got to do. Um, okay, so the elevator pitch is that All Adults Here is a novel about three generations and a family in the Hudson Valley. Um, it's about um, making mistakes and parents making mistakes and how those mistakes reverberate for decades. Um, I think, you know, it's funny, there, there's sort of like the, the goofy inspiration and the, the real one, which very much work together. Um, the goofy inspiration was the Gilmore Girls um, because I really wanted <laughs> to write a book that had that sort of feeling. Like I wanted Stars Hollow. Like I, I was, I was, I wanted to write a book about cheese that felt like the Gilmore Girls. Um, and then I started writing it and I realized that, um, even though there are those elements, like there is a gazebo at the center of town and one of the characters makes goat cheese for a living, um, that it was really much more about like the, the, the state that I am in right now, where I am in the center of the Venn diagram of my family, where like, I have parents who are getting older and I have children who I take care of and I'm right in the middle and I'm supposed to be grown up, you know? Yeah. You're the adult and the parent and the, yeah. And and yeah, exactly. And that, and that it's hard and that, you know, it's, it's a tough spot to be in that, that sort of center chunk of life. Um, and that just because you're there doesn't mean that you've figured things out. And it doesn't mean that, you know, y- you have, <laughs> it doesn't mean you have anything figured out. Um, and so really the book is about that. It's about sort of reckoning with your own choices. Um, which I feel like right now, like right now, that's what we are all doing. Like whatever choices we've made, whether it's 
to get married, to have children, to live in the city, to live in the country, like to live, you know, a you know, a, a really solitary life or to re- live a really busy life, like whatever, like major life choices we've made right now, we are like living inside those choices um, in, a way, in a way that we usually aren't. You know, I feel like most of the time, you know, you like are seeing friends for dinner and, you know, those friends have made different choices than you in various ways. And you can go on vacation with people and whatever. I mean, you can see people um, from different aspects of your life um, and sort of feel like you're mostly in the same boat. But I think that in this situation, it's like really being hammered home, like whatever, whatever major life decisions you've made. Um, and I think that that's, can be uncomfortable to be like, whoa, like, for, you know, I turned 40 on Saturday. And like, thank you. And like, what a time to have a major life milestone. You know, I'm like, okay, okay. Got it. Got it. I am 40 and I don't leave the house. And like, um, you know, this is this, you know, these are the boundaries of my world right now. Um, and that's, that, that is really, I know this is a very long winded way to describe the book. Um, I think I'm like working through a lot of stuff right now, but also this is like a great description and very helpful. Yeah. But that, I mean, but that, to answer your question, that's what the book's about. Um, this question <clears throat> comes from Britt Udison. Allison, what has been your favorite recipe during the pandemic? Oh, I mean, the secret is, is that I don't actually follow any recipes. <laughs> um, I write them. I don't follow them. Um, so like, Honestly, like my cooking and eating habits have been really, really all over the place since this happened. Um, I got really into like eating just like whatever I wanted, whatever I wanted, which I kind of always did, but I'm just home a lot more now. I am a homebody who's never home, like in my Mm -hmm. whole life. I love being at home. I am a nester. I love being here. I love my space. But in my actual life, I'm... I'm just always gone. Like I, I almost never spend an evening at home. Like I'm out for dinner. I'm out for drinks. I'm doing something. And so I've been sort of, it's interesting because I've been like forced to more like practice what my, what I preach, um, <laughs> different of a way. Cause I'm actually like cooking, um, food more for myself, like in a dinner way, like what do I want for dinner? And, um, what's best about it is for me, like, being more connected to how people are cooking and eating. So like figuring out new ways to like, for example, like the New York times call, like instead of just providing like recipe after recipe every other week, like maybe it's going to be like, okay, here's how to snack or like, here's what to do with like that one roast chicken. Here's how to like stretch this thing to make three meals or whatever, like just kind of more living in it right now. And it's, it's been really helpful. So my favorite recipe in this pandemic has been like the pickles from the jar. Um, I, bought, <laughs> I bought Japanese Oreos from Sunrise Market the other day when I went on a, a grocery run and they're like thinner than thin Oreos and they're so good. <laughs> uh, that's not a recipe. That's just like a plug for Japanese Oreos. <laughs> not more <laughs> than the regular ones, just saying. We um, happened to, we have a, a fisherman friend. So we had a lot of salmon in our freezer before this all started and have been enjoying the uh, soy citrus salmon very much. That's been very popular in our house. Um, This is a question for both of you. This is from Sarah Williams. Um, What what books have y'all been enjoying during the quarantine? Um, I can start. I, um, so I, I mean, the, you know, the, the like good news, bad news about owning a bookstore is that like I get every book like six months before it comes out. So usually when I'm reading books, it's like a hundred years before anybody else can get their hands on them. Um, But I will try to only talk about books that are coming out in the near future or have come out recently. Um, So there are a few books by debut authors that I'm really, 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 really excited about that are on my bedside table. Um, 
there's a novel called Conjure Women by uh, a woman named Afia Atakora that I'm really excited about that came out on Tuesday. Um, there's a novel called Days of Distraction by a woman named Alexandra Chang that I'm really excited about. Um, I've also been reading more mysteries, mm -hmm. um, like mysteries and rom-coms, um, AKA cool romance novels. Um, I've been reading that kind of thing a lot too, because that's what my brain wants right now. Um, I just started, um, the new book by Janelle Brown called pretty things pretty. Oh my God. If I get the title wrong, Janelle, please. I apologize. Um, but I just started that and it's great. Um, I read, um, a book called the herd by a woman named Andrea Bartz that like, I, in my previous life, when I left the house, I, I would work at, at this co-working space in Brooklyn called the wing. And <laughs> this book, the herd is all about the wing and it's like a murder at the wing. And I just I like, wait for that. Andrea's I, joining us next week. So stay tuned for her wordplay uh, appearance. We'll announce it on Friday. It's so good. It's so, so I just like, I, I can't tell you how much pleasure I got out of reading that book. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> and then wait, some, some rom-coms. Oh yeah, yeah, wait. Okay. So for anyone who likes, um, the bachelor and, or just dating television shows in general, there's a rom-com that's a debut that comes out, I believe in July called one to watch by a woman named Kate Stamen London. And it's about a plus size fashion blogger who gets chosen as the bachelorette. Mm -hmm. And it's great. 10 out of 10. Loved it. Would watch. Would listen. Yeah. One to watch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I could do this for 400. Well, I need, years. I need something a bit lighter. All the books that I've been yeah. reading these days are just like, cause I, I bought a bunch of books before this all went down and I, I try to like not buy books just when I'm like, don't want to read the ones that I have. I'm like, okay, read the ones that you have, which I'm not sure is like the best practice, but I think you should read what you want to read. Um, but just like in an effort to like, I don't know, spend less money and just move through what I've got. Um, all the books that I have currently are like pretty, uh, are just like the heavier side of things. Um, I started, um, was it called clean the new Garth Greenwall? Oh yeah. Which I'm loving. It's just, it's like intense. It's an intense book. Yeah. Um, to like yeah. read alone. I'm like, Oh, so I'm alone. Um, so, and then I'm reading, I just, I finished, um, the new Samantha Irby. Wow, no, thank you. Obviously, oh, oh, yeah. No, I mean yeah. Samantha Irby, like that, like she. J yeah. That's like the only book anyone needs right now. Really, it's, I was when you were saying like all adults, here. all adults here, also, but the only yeah. two books you need right now. Um, yeah, but that kind of like writing style right now. I'm just like, please, more of this. But it's funny because I do want more like rom commy. Um, yeah. I was also reading Bell Hooks, all about love, because I'd never read it before, and I just yeah. it, like. I forget how it came into my life, but I have it on my bedside table. Um, what else am I reading? I'm, I literally have a stack of books like right over there. Oh, I just started <laughs> reading Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. I'm the last person in Brooklyn to read it. Um, yeah. I can fully report that I, I am into it. It's great. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. It's like a, a real hodgepodge. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm needing something that's like along the lines of like uh, normal people. You know, like, give me that, like, kind of escapism, like, kind of sexy, like, kind of romantic, kind of, like, I, wa I, I wa also wanted, like, a Call Me By Your Name vibe. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. like, give me, like, what can I read that's like that, you know? <laughs> Emma, I want you to recommend something, and I have an idea, too. Okay. I'm going to say Susan Choi, um, An Education. Oh, okay. Interesting. I love, I love Susan Choi. She, she, we had her at the store the other day, and my mom watched on zoom and she called me the next day and she was like susan Choi is so beautiful her hair i just love like i had a long conversation with my mom about susan Choi's amazing hair <laughs> um yeah um oh man 
Put me on the spot, Steph. I'm sorry. You can think about it for a minute. While you're thinking, I'll tell everybody in the audience that we had Samantha Irby join us earlier um, in Wordplay, and we recorded a video of her reading an essay from Wow, No Thank You and played it over um, a loop of bunnies bouncing around in their cage. So if you need something sort of relaxing, it's in our archives. You can find it on Loft. Oh, Emma, I have your number. I'll just text you. You can just text me. You're right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I got that's why you shop at independent bookstores because you have a connection to your bookseller. Yeah. And you text them. <laughs> you me reading advice. It's like a very symbiotic relationship. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, this question from the audience, I love. Um, this is from Julie. It said, hi, Allison. I've been making and devouring your recipes all quarantine. Thank you so much. I know this is a completely unrelated question, but can I, I can never find great gold hoop earrings. Do you mind sharing where yours are from, please? These are from Mexico. I went to, it's like a, not even a funny story. It's like not even a very good story, but I went on a, a capital V vacation this year to Mexico with, with three of my friends. And one of my friends that I was with was like hell bent on finding a St. Anthony chain, like a pendant. And I, I was like, why? He's like, oh, my middle name's Anthony. And I was like, okay. And so <laughs> he, <laughs> he's like not a religious person. I'd never known him to like care about this kind of thing. I've known him for a very long time. And um, anyway, we made it our mission while in Mexico to like find this chain. I was like, why now? He's like, I don't know. I just feel like I'm going to find it in Mexico. So we ended up like discovering this jewelry district in Mexico that was in Mexico city. That was not unlike, you know, the fashion district, the jewelry district here in Flatiron in New York. Um, but it was just like an entire like little cluster of jewelry stores where you can like walk in and out and like they sell gold by the pound if you've ever been the um what is it uh like new top jewelry and on canal it's like that vibe where you're like the gold is by the weight and like they're, they're just like selling chains and and whatever but we found a saint anthony chain or pendant for him and they had it was like the most glorious display of gold hoops i'd ever seen and it was like gold <laughs> hoops and every size shape color thinness thickness <laughs> and I was in heaven. I managed to only buy one pair and they were, they were like $30 or something. Yeah. Um, but they're my favorites and they have like a little claspy thing, but, um, Laura Lombardi makes amazing earrings, but they're brass, not gold. So you do have to polish them, but they're awesome and in really fun shapes. And she's a local designer. Um, where else have I gotten gold hoops? I don't know. I've also just like Googled gold hoop. <laughs> it's not helpful but I feel like you have to own a few pairs before you land on your pair it's kind of like the red lipstick or like a nail polish or a high-waisted jean you, you're like they don't come they don't come naturally they're not effortless like you gotta you gotta wear a lot of and the pair of jeans. You like wear a lot of earrings where you're like it's like one it's like a little too thick you know it's like it's kind of a Goldilocks situation so I I just encourage you to like try I, I used to buy like really cheap ones that were obviously not real and then once I found like the kind of thickness and style I wanted and I was like that's when I'll buy them in gold. I love it well there's more and more questions coming in but unfortunately that is all the time that we have for today I encourage everyone to use the link right down here to buy um, Allison and Emma's books um, you can get there um, you can get nothing fancy and then pre-order all adults here um, or look at their wonderful uh, backlist books. Um, I'm a Straub completist. I recommend all. I'm a, I'm a completist of both collections here. So um, I can vouch for, um, for both of their works. And I just really appreciate um, both of you coming here to join us today. Um, I want to thank Grey Duck for my cocktail today and for sponsoring this event as well as the Star Tribune and St. Catharines um, University. We could not have done any of this without um, those, the support of those organizations um, and the support of people who are attending right now. If you um, like what you see and want to see more, you can find out about it on loftboardplay.org. You can also consider um, supporting us financially at the button below. Um, and I hope that everyone had a good time today. This was just such a nice way to to end the afternoon. Yeah, happy Monday, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Another week. Happy eighth week anniversary, everybody. <laughs> and I'm just gonna ask you two to stay here for a minute while we say goodbye to the audience and thank you again for coming and joining us today. <laughs>